All right, we're continuing our study on hermeneutics and how to study the Bible. Tonight we're talking about the use of commentaries. Um, we'll get into that here in just a second. I hope you're keeping up with the challenge that we've issued of helping us all read. One of the, just as a reminder, in one of the, in fact, the very first study we did, we gave emphasis to the main thing we want to do in Bible study is to read and then read and then read and then read and read the Bible, the text. And then hopefully you're reading a first John, second John, third John, by the time we study that in the next trimester, that you'll see the value of that, and I think you probably already do. So hopefully you're keeping up with that. We are ready for lesson number 12, and that is the use of commentaries. The next two studies will deal with figurative language. We haven't got into that yet, but there will be passages where obviously there is some form of figurative language used, and we'll talk about the various types of figurative language. And in connection with that, our question for next week involves several questions on the Lord's Supper, such as what is the cup? What does it mean to bless? the cup. Uh, when Jesus said, this is my body, what does he mean? Uh, when he said, this is my blood, what does it mean? <clears throat> and we'll get into some figurative expressions even with that in our study next time. All right, we're ready to talk about the use of commentaries. <clears throat> we deliberately put that off to this point in our study, and we did that, as I said, deliberately and on purpose, because that's not the first thing I do. I think there's a concept that some have that when they're ready to study a text, they read their text through one time and then they open their commentary and read what the commentary says and they've done their Bible study. And we're going to deal with some extremes here in just a moment, but before we get into that, I want to suggest that that's not how I go about Bible study. There may be many people who do that, but opening the commentary comes down the line. It, it's on down the line as you've seen from these studies thus far. So let's just pretend we're studying a text. By a text, it may be a chapter. It may be James 5 for Sunday. We're getting ready either to teach it or we just want to be prepared and know what it's about. So James 5 is on docket. Or it may be that you're trying to study a verse that someone has asked you about and it's a controversial or difficult verse. What's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to read. And then after I've read it through once, then what am I going to do? I'm going to read again. And then I'm going to read again, and I'm going to keep reading again and again, several times. Well, one of the first things I'm going to do, if I haven't already done it, and even if I've done this, I'm probably going to see if I need to rework it. I did that this past week on James 4, is I'm going to look for thought patterns to develop in that context. In other words, I'm going to create an outline. Even if I already have one that I think is good, I may rework that. So I'm wanting to get thought patterns. When, when I've outlined my text, half of my work of, of what is done, half of my work of interpretation is done. So I'm half done already, and I've got my thought patterns together. Now then, what am I going to probably do? Particularly on, I, I've got an idea of what verses 1 to 5 are about, verses 6 to 12 are about. I've got a general idea because I've put this outline together after I've read it about seven times. But here's a difficult verse. What am I probably going to do? I'm not sure what this phrase means. What am I ready to do now? Look at different translations because likely those different translations may unlock that meaning for me. Does that make sense? We've done that already. But there's a word or two that I'm not sure how it's meant, what, what is meant by that. Now what am I ready to do? I've checked translations. They've helped. All right. I'm going to look up maybe in Vines or Strong's or I may go to an interlinear or my Bible app and find out the Hebrew or Greek word that's behind that and see how that's defined and where it's used elsewhere because that may enhance my understanding of the text. So you see, my point I'm making is that Long before I ever opened my commentary, I've done a lot of work on this text. Supposing I've not really studied James 5, I'm going to read it, 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 I'm going to read it again, and then I'm going to make sure I've got it outlined and thought structures are put together. I'm going to check other translations, particularly on difficult verses or verses that I'm not sure how to explain. And then I'm going to look up keywords 
that are difficult, and now I've formulated my understanding of the text already. Does that make sense? I haven't opened my commentary yet. I haven't been ready for that. Why? Say again. <clears throat> okay. So I need I need my own understanding before I go to consult someone else. Very good. What'd you say? Okay. So I want to see what I'm saying. Anything else? Why? Why wait this long? Okay. I want to get familiar with the wording of the text before I'm influenced by what somebody thinks about that text. Does that make sense? Before somebody tells me it means this, I want to know what it says. Not what it means. I want to know what it says first. Then I'm going to come to my understanding of what it means before I'm ready to consult with someone else. So do I believe in the use of commentaries? Absolutely. I probably have more than most of you in here. Some of you may have taught me on that, but I don't, not, that's not bragging. I'm just saying I've bought commentaries. I've bought commentaries. Bought commentaries. I probably have, on the book of Romans, I probably have 50 or 60 commentaries just on the one book. All right. But I'm waiting a long time before I ever open that book. That's not my first source I go to. That's what I'm trying to drive home. So let's talk about what we're not saying in the use of commentaries. We're not saying that one must have a commentary to understand the Bible. We're not saying that, that commentaries are the only way to know what a difficult passage means. If you don't have a commentary, you're never going to understand that. We're not saying that the person who has the most commentaries has the better understanding. Sometimes the person that has no commentaries may have a better understanding than the one that's consulted a hundred commentaries. Would that be true? Sure. Could be. We're not saying that one must use commentaries that are written by brethren. We're going to warn about some commentaries in a moment. But we're not saying that unless you're using one that's been written by some brother that you're not using the right commentary. Here's what we are saying in our study tonight. The commentaries are mere tools or aids. That's all they are. Vines, in defining a word, is a tool. It's an aid. Do you have to have vines? To, no, you don't have to. But does it enhance my understanding of what this word means and where else it may be found? Sure it does. Sure it does. What we're saying tonight is commentaries can be helpful and commentaries uh, uh, need to be used properly. Commentaries are often misused. And we're going to begin by looking at, at some extremes. So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at five different things. Some extremes... We're going to look at different types of commentaries, the information to be gained from commentaries, and then we need to know what you have. In other words, if you have a commentary, you need to know what you're looking at, what you're using, who that is, and so forth. And then we're going to talk about how to use the commentary. Let's start with the extremes. Can you think of some extremes that people have, ideas and views and uses people make of commentaries? That's exactly it. Bingo. Hit the nail on the head. Let's start with the latter one first. Some accept whatever it says. Hopefully this doesn't fit you, but I have known people who've in Bible class made comments, and I have a couple of commentaries with me just for illustration, who read, for example, the text. They jump over and they say, oh, that's what that means. And when you, uh, uh, you say, well, I'm not sure what that, well, that's what the commentary says. <laughs> As if it says it, then it must be true. And that's a misuse of a commentary. If you're using a commentary in that fashion, then you need to know, throw your commentary away. You probably don't need a commentary. What we're doing here is letting the commentary do the work for me. It decided for me what the tax means rather than me deciding for myself. Does that make sense? We're letting it do the work for us. In other words, we accept the interpretation without question. Well, you know, he said uh, that's what that means. I really didn't think that's what that meant, so I guess that's what it means. That's an extreme. Here's another extreme. There are those, and, and this is kind of a growing concept. There's no need for a commentary. I, I run into a lot of younger preachers who said, I don't use them. And I don't need commentaries, and I don't use them. Okay, that's great. 
I want to tell you, he's going to be inconsistent. I guarantee he's going to be inconsistent. Because he's going to offer his comments on the passage. Why do I need his comments when he doesn't need anybody else's? That's interesting. So when it says, I don't, I don't ever use commentaries. I, I don't need anybody's opinion. But in Bible class, they'll be one of the first to raise their hand and say, I think this text, we don't care what you think if you don't think you care about anybody else's interpretation. Does that make sense? All right? That's an extreme. A commentary is merely a written class or a written textual study. So let's just take our text. We've got James 5 on our mind for Sunday. And I've read James 5, and I think I know what it means. Could I benefit if I went over and sat in on a class that Kevin Strickland was teaching on James 5? Do you think I could benefit from that? Why wouldn't I? All right, and then when we get through with that, Kevin and I decide we're going to go back here to Brother Peeler, and he's teaching a class. Steve Peeler is teaching a class on James 5. Could the two of us benefit from listening to his comments? Sure we could. So the three of us now, having done that, we go over here and Ricky Bruce is teaching a class on James 5. Do you think we could benefit from what Ricky has to say about James 5? That's all we're doing. When, when you open up Barnes, you're sitting through his class on James 5. When you open up Pulpit, when you open up Dan King, when you open up Guy Woods, when you open up any commentary, you're just sitting in on their class. Make sense? That's all we're doing. That's what a commentary does. So could you benefit from a class from several that are teaching on the passage that you're wanting to learn? So picture yourself going down through a mall and there every store, instead of being a store, is a classroom and they're all having classes on James 5 and you can jump in and get in a part of any one of those classes or all of them. Could you benefit from setting in on those classes? Could you exit the other end of the mall having gained some understanding of James 5? I think I could. That's all we're doing with commentaries. Is that essential? No, but it could enhance my understanding. Now, there's a place for comments. Let's look at Nehemiah 8 and verse 8. What's the circumstance? Someone quickly, we, we don't want to run out of time here. What was going on in Nehemiah 8? Ezra the scribe is, is who's being dealt with. Yes. They read from the book, and then the text says they gave the sense. The New Century and others translated explained what it meant. In other words, if, if I take the text and I say, we are to forgive up unto seven times, I read that passage, and I say, and here's my comment, I say, that means we need to be forgiving. I just gave you an oral commentary, didn't I? I'm explaining what it means. I'm not translating, I'm explaining what it means. Well, that's what they did. So there's, there is a place for comments. So it's possible that someone might have some information I haven't considered. And so as I go to a commentary, they might, have, they might suggest a parallel passage. I didn't think about that. I see that often. I, why didn't I think of that? I might look at that and I see something in the context of connecting thoughts. I never thought about connecting, and I'm just making up fictitious number, I mean, verses here, so I'm not thinking of a particular passage. But I may not have thought how verse 12 relates back to verse 4. I never thought about that. And this commentator just did that. See, I didn't think of that. Or it may be there is a point of the text versus what I thought the point of the verse was. For example, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures given inspiration of God. I may have thought the whole point of it is just driving home the point the Bible is inspired. Well, it is. But that's really not the point there. The point is that inspired text is the answer to the problems mentioned in verses 1 to 5. Somebody helps me see that maybe in their comments. Make sense? Or it may be there's an application I hadn't thought about. I never thought about that fitting the family like it does. And this commentator made that point. And so it can enhance my understanding of that. So do you see the extreme views? The person that says, I have no use for them. Okay, you don't have to use them. But I guarantee you'll be inconsistent. And the person that says, I believe whatever it says, you're going to be inconsistent too because if you get a second commentary, you can't believe both of them because they're probably not in agreement fully. All right, let's talk about di different types. I want to hurriedly mention this because this is just driving home the point. All commentaries are not equal. 
How many of, just an interest in a show of hands, how many of you have enough commentaries that you've noticed there's a variation, not just in what their comments are, but in types of commentaries? All right, good. There are different levels of commentaries. There are some that are very scholarly, written and written for those who have some degree of scholarship. And uh, Lagos calls these the exegetical commentaries. In their works, they list it as that. They often deal with the original language, and you'll be reading along, and there'll be a whole phrase in Hebrew. I mean, it's the Hebrew letters, and so you think, I don't know what that says. And there'll be a whole phrase in Greek in the New Testament. And, then, and so here's this phrase, just like we found, and then here's a similar phrase, and you don't know if it's similar or not because you can't read Greek. Those are good commentaries. Uh, an example, Callan Datelich fits that. It's an excellent set of commentaries. Many of you have that if you have an, a Bible program, but it's one of the deeper commentaries. I wouldn't start with that. If you don't have any commentary, I wouldn't go out and buy Callan Datelich. I wouldn't do that. So there's some that are very scholarly. Some are written for the commentary, I mean, for the common man, and that's what Jesus spoke to was the common man, Matthew 12, 37. Uh, this is what Lagos calls the expository. Uh, that's, I'm just using their terminology there. And so this doesn't wade too deep for the common reader. Um, most of your commentaries that you have probably are of that, that uh, level. The ones I use primarily are at that level. Some are very thorough and some are brief. And so here's, for example, James 5. You may find one that, that has written 50 pages on James 5. And then you find another one that's written three pages on the same chapter. Doesn't mean that, that one's good and one's bad. It just means there's different levels. Is that, that's all I'm driving at. Does that make sense? Sometimes the briefer are the better. Ray Summers, and write that down if you're interested in a good commentary on, on Revelation. Ray Summers' book, he was a Baptist, but he wrote one of the best commentaries on the book of Revelation uh, that you'll find. It is brief because he gets to the heart of each chapter. He summarizes it. Gets, this is the point, drives it home, then moves on. He, he captures the thought of the Revelation. So the brief doesn't always mean it's inferior. There are different styles. There's language commentaries, at least uh, in Lagos, we, we classify those. I'm, I'm, Lagos, I'm talking about the Bible program. They teach you to, uh, to uh, as you take their, their training courses, teach you to classify your commentaries by groups. And so there's, there's language commentaries like A.T. Robertson, M.R. Vinson, and Barclay fit into the language where they focus primarily on what do the words mean, but they still make comments. There's the homiletic commentary. What's a homiletic commentary? If you go to the store and the bookstore and, and here's a homiletical commentary, what are you going to pick it up and you're going to, what are you going to find? Yeah, the homiletical section is, is sermon material. And so it's basically practical application. It, th th this is what, this is, uh, this what I learned from this chapter. Here's three points I learned from this chapter. Uh, here's three things I learned from Genesis 1. Um, Wearsby, I have a copy of Wearsby. Wearsby's whole, he's got a whole set of commentaries through the whole Bible. He's a, he was a Baptist. He does an excellent job outlining, and it's excellent with practical lessons. But he's not the greatest commentator because he's a hom homiletical man, uh, at least in his work there. Uh, part of the pulpit commentary fits that. Preacher's homiletical fits that. Most of your commentaries fit into the verse-by-verse verse, pulpit, Barnes, Truth, uh, Commentaries, Truth for Today, Gospel Advocate, and most commentaries fit into that where you open it up and it's just verse-by-verse. Verse. So James chapter 5, verse 1, then ver followed by verse 2 all the way through the end of the chapter. Make sense? Or I'm just trying to get you to see different styles. Some just summarize a section. Matthew Henry, if you've got access to Matthew Henry, if you've got a Bible program, you probably do. Uh, Matthew Henry will not take it verse by verse. He'll take verses 1 to 10 and comment on that. And so you don't have a great de detail, and it's got uh, several things that are very practical. This, again, is Lagos. This is how they classify commentaries. I don't know that I fully agree with their classification, but that's how Lagos Bible Software classifies those. Now, what kind of information am I going to find when I get my commentary? I've just bought a commentary, and here's a sample. Here's Dan King's on James. And I've not looked at it. Let's pretend that. And I've never even used a commentary before. What am I going to expect to find when I open up this commentary? I'm just starting a book of James. So what, what can I find, particularly as I open the book up? Okay. Who the author is, where he's from, to whom it's written, et cetera, introductory information. Kinds of things we give as we introduce a book here. When was it written? Why was it written? What does it deal with? Et cetera, et cetera. 
is that information that's helpful? Can I learn that without the commentary? Yes. But the commentary often has done its research. The commentator has done his research. He's packed all that in one, one simple package, and I can benefit from that. And some do very little. And uh, if you ever read from Dan, I quote from Dan King a lot. Dan's a good friend. Uh, Dan's works always, he's got about five or six commentaries out. His works always are heavy on the introduction, more so than on the commentary. Heavy on the introduction. Um, but anyway, uh, I'll find introductory information. What else will I find? An outline of the book and an outline of the chapters. So if I'm not good at that, um, or if I am good at that, I want to consult that to see if he can shake my or move me. I think there are four sections to the book, and he thinks there's five. I want to know why, and I'm going to look at his outline. Make sense? And I'm going to go to each chapter and find an outline. Sometimes it's at the beginning of the commentary. Sometimes it's scattered throughout. So I'm going to look for that. All right, what else am I going to find in this commentary? Maybe in the introduction, it may be scattered in the chapters. I may find some reference to historical or cultural things. For example, the, uh, some of the parables, like the parable of the wedding feast, may seem odd to us. And so he may give us some description of historical things or cultural things that help me to understand better. That, uh, for example, some of the references I don't understand because I try to put it in modern setting. Uh, for example, that she was, remember the, the woman uh, uh, with her tears wiping Jesus' feet and she was behind him, but he's sitting at the table. Well, you sit at a table and somebody behind you can't very well get to your feet, but you can if you're reclining, as was the custom of the early days. Does that make sense? So I'll learn some of that from, from a commentary maybe. What else am I going to learn? The main thing of a commentary is the verse by verse comments. So I'm going to have comments on verse one, verse two, and on down the line. But I'm also going to see how the text flows. What do I mean by that? How the thoughts tie together. And so it's not just, we have verse one, here's what it means. Separate and apart from that, we have verse two, here's what it means. And then separate and apart from that, verse three, it may be that verses 1 to 3 is developing a thought, maybe a progression of thought, and the commentary may help me see that, that I didn't see before. I may never have seen how that this first section, verses 1 to 5, is the, leads into this thought over here in verses 6 to 10. Does that make sense? And now I see that. I never saw that before, but he helped me see that. All right? And then I'm going to see in that commentary quite often application. We're going to have a whole lesson. I believe that's maybe our last one. I'm not sure. I believe it is. Application and practical lessons. Why is that so helpful? Principles without application mean nothing. Absolutely mean nothing. you say something, Jared? Got to know how to apply that. So that's kinds of things. I'm, I'm, I'm going to find more than just a verse-by-verse -verse comment. Does that make sense? Now, that's quite simplistic. Uh, I may see how hermeneutics work. What do we mean by that? I may learn that from reading this commentary. Yeah, if he's worth anything, if you didn't catch what Drew just said, more often than not, he's going to tell you how he arrived at his conclusion. If he gives me his conclusion without giving me any evidence, I'm not interested in, in his comment. I don't, know what, I don't want to know what he thinks. But more often than not, he's going to say, I think this verse means because, and he works through the hermeneutics of that. So I just learned, without going through a class on hermeneutics, how hermeneutics work. Does that make sense? How did he arrive at that? He looked at parallel verses. He looked at translations. He defined the word. He showed that this is a, uh, an expression that is figurative in its nature. So now I'm learning something about hermeneutics from, from reading my commentary. It helps me. Anything else I'm going to gain by looking at the commentary, the information that's found there? All right. Let's talk about knowing what you have. Knowing what you have. Let's, let's suppose you go to the bookstore or you look on Amazon and you bought this. Commentary is on sale. You don't have a clue who it is. Um, I don't know who that is. But it was cheap and I bought this and this is a book on... Uh, Commentary on the book of Romans. Now, 
what would you advise me if, if, if I said, I, I don't know what this is, but I, I found this cheap. In danger? All right. He may be a Calvinist, may not be. He may be a premillennialist, may not be. I don't know. Notice the box up at the top. Be careful because commentaries always involve man's thoughts. When I'm reading the text, I don't have to worry about that because it's, it's God's thoughts. But when I'm reading from man, it's man's thoughts. Man's comments means he could be wrong. So I need to know something of the commentator. Now, I don't always know every commentator, but particularly if I'm just using one or two commentaries or three or four, most of us, if you've got 50 commentaries, you're, you've got your five favorite and there's where you go most of the time. Most all of us do that, self-included. So is he a brother? There are several brethren written commentaries. And is he institutional or conservative? Because that may have a lot to do with the direction he's going to go on some passages. I want to know that. So uh, Guy Woods, for example, has an excellent commentary on James, but he's going to miss it on James 1. He's going to miss it, and he did. But I need to know that and not be shocked and surprised. All right? What is his denominational bend? What difference does that make? All right? I cite Barnes. Anybody know what Barnes was? I, I quote Barnes a lot. Presbyterian. He was a Presbyterian. That means he was a full-fledged Calvinist in his theology. But if you read much from Barnes, you know this. Barnes sometimes thought more of his scholarship than he did his theology. Because he will say that I believe this, but the text actually says that. Now that's dishonest, I won't tell you. <laughs> Say, I believe otherwise, but the text actually says. I've seen that happen. I, I took a course at the uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Seminary in Greek, and um, my, my professor did the same thing. He took a passage and exegeted it and said, here's what the text actually says, but the, the theology department down the hall will tell you otherwise, but that's what it says. And he was right. Well, now Barnes does that sometimes. Barnes is an excellent commentator, but he will miss it sometimes. There are two things to watch for, two major doctrines. There, there are many, but there are two major doctrines you need to watch for in commentaries. What are they? I've just I've already mentioned them. Premillennialism, 80% of, den, of the denominations believe in premillennialism. So if you have a denominational commentary, most likely he believes in premillennialism. Very likely, 80% chance at least. What's the other one? Calvinism. Calvinistic implications. He may not be full-fledged Calvinist. He may be a neo-Calvinist. All right, is he a modernist? There are modernist commentaries um, that deny the inspiration of the scriptures. And so you come to 1 Timothy 2, 1 Corinthians 14, where it talks about the role of women, and he'll say that was all cultural, and we can disregard that for our day. And so if, that's, if you're not familiar with where he's coming from, you may be kind of shocked. Wow, he, he doesn't believe this passage applies. It's a modernist. All right. We're still talking about knowing what you have. It's best, this is my recommendation, that you get commentaries based on recommendations. In other words, don't go out on Amazon and start shopping and here's a commentary, it's on sale or whatever. Buy commentaries based on recommendations. I don't mean it has to be from me, but talk to someone who's used some commentaries and get a recommendation. What's the best commentary on Ezekiel, for example? We're about to study Ezekiel next quarter, uh, next trimester. What's the best commentary on whatever book we're going to be studying, on the Minor Prophets? We're going to deal with some of those next time. And uh, get a recommendation from someone so that you know something of the commentary before you buy it. Does that make sense? So don't worry about buying a set by individual volumes that are highly recommended. If, if, unless you've just got lots of money, you, want to, you like all these sets looking on your, your, your shelf, you may buy this book on, on Revelation, this one on Romans, and this one on Matthew, and they don't match in color. Who cares as long as you've got good material? Does that make sense? All right. Now, several commentaries are available in electronic form. Most of your Bible programs come with like Barnes and Pulpit, etc. cetera. Uh, truth commentaries are now available in PDF. I'm not here to sell commentaries or books. We're talking about Bible study aids, and I'm just letting you know of those. And many commentaries are, are available online. Uh, these three sites we've already given, but blueletterbible.org, biblestudytools.com, and biblehub.com, 
you can find as many as 15 to 20 commentaries on there. So if you say, I want to search this verse out, and I don't have but two commentaries, I can find 20 more at BibleHub.com, or Blue Letter Bible. Does that make sense? Don't have to spend a dime. Those are free. Um, if you like the electronic, uh, get the PDF formats of some of the others. Now, let's spend the rest of our time talking about how to use the commentary. We're only going to make four points here. And two of them are extremely important. All of them are important, but four, two of them are extremely important. And you say, I know how to use a commentary. Not everybody does. That's obvious from the extremes. So here's the first thing that we need to remember. Well, that's not the first thing I was meant to mention. Um, but turning to a commentary is not the first thing I do. I, I want you to know that up front, that that's not what I do first. Now, that may be what you want to do, but I'm reading my text, reading my text. I'm doing other things before I ever open my commentary. So if you give me an assignment, look at this, this text. Let's look at this, this context. I'm going to be reading and reading and looking at translations, doing very outlining. I'm going to do various things. And you say, well, what the commentary? I ain't got there yet. I ain't got there. I'm doing that later. Make sense? All right. Now, when I get ready to look at the commentary, here's the first thing I need to realize. That this is written by man and he, he can be wrong. Not, though, if he's a brother in the Lord, right? He may be wrong, and the denominationalists may be right on that verse. I found that to be true. I disagree with brother so-and-so. And this guy over here, Barnes, I agree with him. I think he's right. He, he got it. may not be a major doctrinal point, but just explain the verse correctly. So it's all written by man. Always approach it. This is written by man, and it's not God's word. Secondly, this is one of the two important things. See if the commentator can move me or change my mind. That's really what commentators, commentaries are to be used for. That's not good grammar, is it? <laughs> um, that's how they're to be used. Is to see if they can move me off. Tell you who drove that principle to my mind, if I can get his... Um, um, Bob Waldron. Some of you have Bob Waldron. Bob was, is one of the best Bible students I've known. I've spent time with him and sat across the table with him, eat with him, I've been with him in a meeting, etc., and spent time with him talking about Bible passages. He has, in, ha, has an incredible knowledge. Bob has written a number of things. And I asked him, how does he go about his study? And he says, I don't ever open a commentary to learn what the text means. I open a commentary to see if the commentator can move me off of what I already believe. Now, that's powerful. I want that to sink in for a moment. So you take James 5, and I've read James 5, and I've formulated what I think the text is saying. I'm going to open up and see if Dan King can move me off of that. I'm going to see if he can move me off of that. To see if he can change my mind. If he cannot produce evidence to change my mind, guess what? I'm, not going, to, I'm going to stick with what I thought the text means. That's what I'm going to teach. That's what I'm going to believe until somebody changes my mind. Does that make sense? That goes for all of us. When you come to Bible class and you formulate, here's what I think James 5 is about, and I teach it contrary to what you thought, if I can't change your mind, you stick to your guns. Stick to your guns. Make sense? Now, here's the second of the things that we want to make sure that's really important. Watch for evidence for the interpretation. What do we mean by that? All right, why did he say that? So I don't care if it's Dan or if it's uh, Guy Woods or if it's Barnes or uh, Pulpit. They say the text means X, Y, Z. I'm not looking for just an explanation. I'm looking for evidence of why he thinks that. Let's just take, for example, there are a number of passages where there's controversy over whether it's the second coming or the destruction of Jerusalem. And I have a hard time sometimes. I, I, I can see where either one would fit. So I'm going to consult the commentary that I have a lot of confidence in, and he says it's the second coming. I'm not interested in that. I want to know why he thinks it's the second coming. What evidence can he cite? Can he change my mind? And so he's convinced me it's the second coming. All right, put him down and I grab another one, and he says it's the, the destruction of Jerusalem. What am I looking for? What evidence that he cites. If it's stronger than the evidence on the other side, guess what? I've changed my mind. But if he hasn't got strong evidence, I'm going to hold my guns. 
I know that's simplistic, but I want to tell you that's powerful in studying and, and the use of commentaries. All right? God's people always are told to look for evidence. I'm going to drive that point home. What, what's the point of Deuteronomy 17, 6, Matthew 16, 18, 16, 1 Timothy 5, 19? Let's take 1 Timothy 5, 19. That an, an accusation of an elder is not to be established except before two to three witnesses. The one was not to be put to death except on the testimony of two to three witnesses, Deuteronomy chapter 17. You're, uh, you're not to withdraw from someone or make charges unless it's established, Matthew 18, by two or three witnesses. What's that say? Got to have evidence. Exactly. Got to have evidence. We're to search the scriptures to see if things are so. Where's the evidence? See, that's what we're looking for. Don't accept everything you hear. What does Proverbs 18, 13, and 17 say? He, verse 17 says, He that is first to defend his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Another, there's another side to the story. Get the evidence. Does that make sense? So God's people always ought to be looking for evidence. So I'm not going to a commentary to find out what the text means. I want to know the evidence he can cite for his interpretation. Because I'm not smart enough to know all the evidence that's out there. I want, to help, I want some help in getting that. Someone to show me and say, okay, here's why, why I think that means that. All right, I'm looking for that. And so I'm asking, did he give proof of his explanation? What was his evidence convincing? Well, he gave evidence, but it wasn't convincing to me. I'm not, I'm not going there just yet. All right, here's the fourth of the four things. Don't depend on just one commentary. What's the problem there? Yeah. And so I've got, I've got maybe uh, 30 commentaries here, and I've only checked five, but all five say the same thing and all cite the same evidence. That's pretty strong. That's pretty strong. Um, and so I, I'm, I may, I'm talking about generally speaking, there are going to be some exceptions to that. Now, here are the two things I want you to remember if you don't remember anything else. How am I going to use a commentary? I'm using him to see if he can move me off of what I've already concluded because I've done lots of study before I open the commentary. And so I'm depending too much on man if I read my Bible once and then I jump to the commentary. That's, don't, don't use a, Bible, a commentary that way. Use it to move you off to see if they can change your mind. And I think you'll find your Bible study in hand. And then the second thing was make sure you're watching for the evidence. Make sense? Simple stuff. I know it's simple. But not everybody knows how to use a commentary like you perhaps know how to use. All right. Any questions or comments on commentaries? Now, I'm not here to sell books and uh, that kind of thing, but let me just make uh, some suggestions. If you say, I'm interested in, in putting together some, some Bible study aids, I don't care whether you do or don't, I'm just making some suggestion, that you buy those in, 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 in uh, connection with our Bible studies. So look at what the schedule is, it's online, there's a sheet out in the vestibule what we're dealing with next time, next go around. Um, so let's say we're dealing with the minor prophets. Ask somebody about a good recommendation for a commentary on the minor prophets. That'd be a good time to buy one. You don't need a commentary on Leviticus because you're probably not going to be studying Leviticus. Wait till you get to Leviticus to buy that one. Does that make sense? So it don't get too expensive and buy two or three different ones. And some of the more briefer ones like the Bible textbook series we've talked about, uh, some stuff at One Stone and some of the Hark Rider stuff, those are brief commentary workbooks. Those are sometimes helpful. They have some pretty good insights. The footnotes alone in some of the Bible text books are, are worth the price. All right. Let's go now to our question for tonight. 1 Timothy 5, 17. This is one that's been submitted. And so the question is, does this passage authorize elders to be paid by local congregation they shepherd? So we're interested in knowing what that text says. That's true. Really what we're trying to do here is learn. I, I mentioned every time we deal with a question. The mechanics of how we do this. That's what this class is about, right? So we're not just fishing and giving you fish, we're teaching you how to fish, right? That's what we're trying to do. 
So what was the first thing I'm going to do in looking at 1 Timothy chapter 5? I'm not going to, obviously, if you say, well, let's go to the commentary, you, you, you failed the class. You just failed. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. I'm not ready for my commentary yet. I'm going to read. And so I'm going to read the immediate verses. I was asked about verse 17. I'm going to read it, but I might need to read more. I might even need to back up and read the whole chapter. And I'm going to read that several times. And then I'm going to try to see what the flow of the chapter is. And I might check some other translations and see if it, and it may or may not help me. I might look at some words to see if I could define those. And then, uh, so let's look at the verse, first of all. It said, let elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. For... The scripture says you must not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his hay, uh, wages. And then he goes on, still talking about elders, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. And those who are sinning rebuke, rebuke in the presence of all uh, that the rest may fear. Now, I need to back up. Again, we're, we're dealing with the mechanics of this. I'm going to go not only read those verses, what else am I going to read? I'm going to look at the whole context. I'm going to back up and read the whole chapter. And I'm going to see if there's anything in like verses 1 to the end of the chapter that may point to these verses or relate to that somehow. So we're pretending a lot in this class because of time's sake. So let's pretend we've done all of that. And I see that he's basically dealing with various instructions. He dealt with uh, treatment of older and younger, verses 1 and 2, widows in verses 3 to 16. And now he talks about elders in 17 to 20. And then he shifts gears to talk about personal instruction. So our context primarily is going to be 17, 18, 19, and 20. All right, that's what I've learned from multiple readings through the chapter. Now what? We've got a question that we've been asked. I'm not, I'm not jumping to my commentary yet. Keep that closed. I might check translations. One of the things we also do besides translations and maybe defining a difficult word, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difficult words here. There doesn't seem to be a difficult phrase that I can't figure out what does it mean by this phrase. I might look for some phrases though that give me some key. Let's start at verse 17. Let the elders who rule well, that's not hard to understand, we're talking about elders. And elders who rule well, that is they're doing their job and they're doing it well, be counted worthy of, here's an expression that I might need to stop and pause on. Double honor. I haven't seen that anywhere else, have I? Not with reference to elders, at least. Now, do I find passages like in Hebrews that talk about honoring elders? Sure. But that's not the wording here. He didn't say, let, let elders be shown honor. Let them be shown double honor. Now, before we get through, I might search over and look at a commentary to see if my understanding be correct. But I'm trying to formulate double honor. That must be something in addition to the honor shown because of his role. Are we to honor elders because of the role they, they hold, the position they hold? Hebrews 13 says so. But this is something about double honor. There's an, uh, there's an honor that's in addition to that, seemingly. Now, I may change my mind on that, but that's my formulation so far. Does that make sense, what I'm doing? What else am I going to do that may be helpful? All right, I may search that out, see if I can find where double honor is used anywhere else. One of the things I'm looking for are key words that help interpret. Let's go through this. And uh, someone holler, if you see a key word, stop me when you get the key word, particularly verse 18. So let's go back at 17. Let the elders rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture... Why'd you stop at four? Four tells us that what he's about to say All right, here's a key word. Four gives me a key that what he's just said has a connection with what he's about to say. Make sense? Drew called a key word. 
For the scripture says, where does he quote from? Deuteronomy 25, 4. And then he adds another quotation. Deuteronomy 25, 4 says, you're not muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. Now let's stop there. What did that refer to? Right. If you muzzle him, he can't eat. So he's allowed to eat of the grain he's treading. So he benefits from the work he's doing. All right. Then there's another quotation, and, and that's the labor is worthy of his wages. Where is that taken from? Luke 10, 7. One from the old, one from the new. What does it mean, the labor is worthy of his wages? All right. So these are obviously talking about passages that have to do with pay, right? Some kind of pay. The, the ox, you don't muzzle the ox that treads, uh, uh, treads the, uh, out the grain. And a laborer is worthy of his wages. The term wages is used. What does wages refer to? What you are paid. Dickie, you've worked for Nissan for years. Did they give you wages? What, what was that? Was that uh, uh, benevolence? They just giving you money? What you work for, and you're getting paid for that. That's what that was. So there's a key word here, pay, uh, wages. I might look to see where that expression, uh, where these passages are quoted, like the, you should not muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. Where is it found elsewhere, other than Deuteronomy? Can I find it anywhere else? 1 Corinthians. How is it used in 1 Corinthians 9? All right, it is the same passage, same language, same terminology. They're used to argue for the right to pay preachers. Do preachers have to be paid? In other words, can a man preach without being paid? Sure. Is it right to pay a preacher full time to do the work of preaching? Sure. That's what 1 Corinthians 9 is talking about. That's what 2 Corinthians 11 is talking about. But here he's not talking about preachers. He's talking about elders. So now let's go back to our question. Does this passage authorize elders to be paid by a local congregation they shepherd? What would be your conclusion? Yes. Because that's what he's talking about is elders. Isn't that the context? Well, I'm talking about preachers. Now they are teaching. They're laboring in the word. But he didn't, he's not talking about evangelism. He's talking about elders in this context. And he uses terminology to argue for Paying preachers uses the same thing here so, uh, for, for paying elders. So our time is gone, and I think our conclusion would have to be, yes, it's right. Now, have I ever met someone that was paid full-time? I've known of some, but I never personally knew them. But I've known of some churches who had full-time elders. Uh, not the whole eldership, but maybe uh, of maybe five elders. One of them uh, would be retired or maybe near retirement or maybe wasn't near retirement, and they pay him full-time to do the work of an elder. So he's out doing things uh, all day, every day with reference to shepherding the flock, etc. So would that be scriptural? Absolutely, it would. Does it make sense, before we leave that, how we came to our conclusion? I'm not as much interested in the conclusion as how we got there, whether you agree or disagree. Make sense? All right, figurative language next time.